ask you to stand with me this morning. I know that you just sat. But we will never forget. We will never forget. And so this morning I ask that you join me in a moment of silence for those that passed and gave their lives on 9-11. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning. So good to have you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome. For those that are joining online, we're so glad you're with us this morning. I want to do three things. I want to read God's word. I want to pray. And I want to get in it. Did anybody come here this morning wanting to hear from God? Because I did. I came here this morning wanting to hear from God. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. 1 Peter 2 4. Here's what it says. I'm reading out of the NLT. It says, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's people, of God's temple. He was redirected, he was, sorry, he was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. When I was reading this, I, someone here needs to hear this, that while you have been rejected by people, you have been chosen by God. And another word for chosen is accepted. You have been rejected by people, but you have been accepted by God. The universe maker, the star breather, the one that had, the one that bore, that, that, that created you in your mother's womb. He has accepted you. Verse 5 says, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Verse 7. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Verse 8, and he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. That's the gospel right there. That for those that choose not to obey God's word and take Jesus into their life and accept his payment for their sins, that they go to hell to pay for their own sins. But that's not God's plan. God sent Jesus so that we could know him, so that we could receive payment for our sins and not have to pay for our sins on our own. Verse 9 says, but you are not like that. You ready? This is the good stuff. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you, have sh you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10, once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Verse 11, dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents, residents and foreigners, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Verse 12, be careful to live properly among unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of wrongdoing, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. 
Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, reveal to us who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. When I lived here a long time ago, my favorite station, on the uh, favorite radio station, um, you know, you used to listen to music and you actually had to tune in a radio. It didn't stream. My favorite one was 98 Rock, WIYY Baltimore. And I remember a news story that flashed across the wire, and it was, it was kind of, they were kind of poking some fun, but it was the, uh, the lead singer for the Black Crows, Chris Robinson. And he goes into a 7-Eleven, he gets whatever it was, soda, whatever it was, he goes up to the counter. And the clerk tells him how much it is. And Chris Robinson says, do you know who I am? And the clerk, without missing a beat, said, I have no idea who you are, and you still have to pay for your soda. My world does not know who I am. My world does not care who I am. Sometimes I don't even know who I am. Do you know who I am? Who am I? No. Mm -mm. I am chosen. I am priceless. I am loved. I am forgiven, and I am qualified. I am who God says I am. How about you? Who are you? Do you know who you are? Say it with me. I am who God says I am. I'll say it like you mean it. I am who God says I am. That means that you are chosen. You are priceless. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are qualified. See, the struggle that we have is that there's so many voices, so many, so many people, so many instances, so many things outside of us that want to change that identity. They want to mold us into an image that they want, that they feel comfortable with. But that is not who God has called you to be. Think about the people in your world that say things like, well, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're not strong enough. You're never going to get it right. Why can't you be more like her? Why can't you be more like him? What is wrong with you? Sometimes those are people that are very close to us. And they try and shape our identity because they don't like who we are. They don't like who we've become. Sometimes we do it to ourselves, don't we? You get inside your head. Have you ever said this? I don't even know who I am anymore. Like we lose our identity. And, and a lot of times it's because we're, we're running from pain or we're running from hurt. And so we hold on to things like bitterness and anger and frustrating. You ever, you ever said to yourself, don't raise your hand, but I mean, I am just a bitter person. Or, 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 or you say, I'm just angry all the time. I am, I am a frustrated person. I am. You just, you speak these things into your mind. I speak these things into my mind. And it tears away at the identity that I am in Christ. Which is I am, and you are, and we are chosen. We are priceless. We are loved. We are forgiven. We are qualified. And then, like, that's not enough. We have the people in our lives, some of those close to us. Then we have our own minds, like, losing its mind, completely coming unglued, telling us things that aren't true. And then we've got the media. We've got our culture. We've got social media. And what do they do? You know, hey, if you're going to be, you got to buy this. If you're gonna, you got to wear this. If you're going to be acceptable, you're gonna, if you're going to be one of us, if you're going to fit in, if you're going to be acceptable, then you've got to dress like this, talk like this, walk like this, be like this. And if you're not, then you need to be like, you need to dress like, you need to act like, 
And God help us all if we happen to not be that way and make a mistake of posting something like that on social media. I mean, it just gets lit up, doesn't it? You ever like just been yourself, like just truly who you are and you, you get in front of your, your device and you, you send something out and you're just being you. You're not trying to be fake. You're not trying to be something you're not. You're just being you. And man, it just gets hammered. Like what is wrong with you? Where you, I mean, but if you pretend to be somebody that you're not, you get all kind of praise, Right? The false self, the pretending to be somebody that you're not, people love that. The more misery, the more miserable you are, the more misery you're going through, the more likes you'll get. So you've been going about it all wrong. You think it's the pictures. It's not the picture. It's the misery. The more hurt you are, the more you reveal about. That's what people, that's what social media eats up. Misery loves company. That is not who God has called you to be. That is not your identity. You are not the circumstances that you're walking through. You're not them. You are chosen. You are priceless. You are loved. You are forgiven. And you are qualified. That's who you are. You are who God says you are. Not social media. Not the culture that you live in. Not the media that is pounding and everywhere you look. Right? It's TV. It's on your, on your iPhone, or it's on your tablet, or it's on your computer. Everywhere, pushing, shaping. Wanting you to believe something that's not true about you. And here is the culprit of all culprits. The devil. Satan. See, we want to pretend that's not real. We just want to come to church and be loved. God is love. But Satan's real. He, the Bible tells us that he roams around looking for who he can devour, who he can destroy. And you know one of the first things he does? He starts to work at who you think you are, who that God has spoken into your life and you hold on to that and this is who I am and he starts to pick at it. You know how he does it? He puts thoughts in your mind. You're like, no, 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 wait a minute. He can't do that. Sure he can. People can do that. Haven't you had someone say something to you or infer something to you and you start to chew on it a little bit? You start to think about it. You start to take it in. You start to turn it over in your mind. Is that true? Somebody says to you, you're angry all the time. No, I'm not. But when you're by yourself and you're quiet, you start thinking, hmm, am I angry all the time? The devil does the same thing. He says things like, you can never be forgiven for that. I know you. You know you. There is no forgiveness. You think that God Almighty gives one rip about you? What makes you think that you have any value at all? You're worthless. You know, I don't know why you just don't end it and be done with it. That's the things that go through our minds. And the number one weapon that he has is that if he gets us to start thinking about it, the next step is he gets us to repeat it. And then we start to say things like, you know, I'm not very worthwhile. I am angry all the time. There is no hope. Why am I sad all the time? Why, why is life so hard? We, we start to speak that stuff into our life. We start to take root. And guess what? Our identity stops being what God has said, who God has said we are. And our identity begins to be this, this, this lie that Satan has crafted. And we believe it. And we live our lives out of that. Do you understand that you live your life based on who you think you are? Not who people think you are, who you think you are. So when you start to take in what other people say and you start to get your mind messed up and the devil comes in and you start to repeat the things that he pours into your soul, you start to change who you are. You start to live differently. You start to live with depression and anxiety and hurt and pain. And I'm telling you, you don't have to live that way because that is not who's God, that is not God's identity for you. You are chosen. You tired of hearing that yet? We've got six weeks coming. So get used to it. We are chosen. We are priceless. We are loved. We are forgiven and we are qualified. It's coming. Because here's the thing. 
the devil can steal your identity, then he can use you to impart that or to, to get others to believe, to pull others away from what they believe. And we're not gonna let that happen. You are who God says you are. We're gonna take the next few weeks, we're gonna look at a passage of scripture. It's a piece of a letter that the apostle Peter wrote. And we're gonna learn in detail what it is that God says about us. A few weeks ago, we talked about our past is not our future. You remember that? See, so many of us have had things spoken into our lives in our past that we just can't shake off. We just can't get rid of it. Lies that people have poured into us, things that the devil has said that he's, he's woven into how we, how we live our lives and what he says about us. That is not who God says you are. In Christ, you are his. And you are chosen, priceless, loved, forgiven, qualified. You don't have to believe the lie. Young people, listen to me. In, your, in so, such a short period of time, you have had such <laughs> stuff poured into your life that is just not true. You need to look a certain way and act a certain way and be a certain way. And that is from the devil. That is not who God says that you are. But we've got to know how to stand against that. It's one thing to stand up here and talk about it. It's another thing to stand against it. And you know how Jesus stood against the devil? You know how Jesus stood against the things that came against him? With scripture. And that's what we're going to do. Look at your Bibles with me. We're going to be back in 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to go to verse 9. And I just, I just want to say this before we get too far down this road. I know that's a lot to take in in just 37 seconds. But I believe that this is such an epidemic within the church that we as Christians, we have lost our identity. We have allowed the devil to speak lies. We've allowed people to impress and impart things to us that just aren't true. And we're living out of that. And until we take back our identity, until we step into who we are in Christ, we are going to struggle to reach people for Christ because we don't even know who we are. Hey, let me, let, me, let me read this to you. How will I know my identity? Apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot know the meaning of our life, of our death, of God, or of ourselves. Blaise Pascal, a mathematician. 17th century philosopher. For non-math majors, that's 16th, 1600s. Way back then. You hear what he said? Like, without knowing Jesus, you'll never know who you are. Without taking your, your life and laying it before the Savior and saying, what I have is yours, it belongs to you. You will not know who you are. Why do you think our world struggles so much? Because they don't know who they are. They're lost. That's not, that's not God's plan. God's plan is Jesus dying on a cross so that we don't have to pay for our own sins so we can know exactly who we are. I think there's a football game on today. Am I right? <laughs> Being a little purple and floating around here this morning. I'm going to give you something called a highlight reel. How many knows what a high, How many of you know what a highlight reel is? The great plays, right? Great plays of the game, or maybe the great plays of a of a period of time. It's a highlight reel. I'm going to give you the highlight reel of your identity this morning, and then over the next several weeks, we're going to dig into what each one of them means. But here we go. First Peter two verse nine. 
But you are not like that. Say, see that. Say, I mean, right, man, I don't, Peter is fantastic. Right out of the gate. But you are not like that. See, verses 7 and 8, he's talking about those that haven't made a decision for Christ. They're trying to figure life out on their own. They're trying to, to work things out. They're eventually going to pay for, them, for their sins themselves. So right out of the gate, Peter says, you're not like that. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not like that. You're not like that. For you are chosen people. You are chosen. I can't wait. This is next week. I can't wait. I'm going to try not to ruin it. But I just have to tell you this. Another word for chosen is accepted. You are accepted by God. Remember early on said rejected by people, but you are accepted by God. You ever been picked last for kickball? Right? I mean, I know none of you are because you're all like expert kickball players. But me, when I was little, because I was really little, I grew like a foot over summer. It's ridiculous. I mean, I was like the shortest kid in my class, went home, grew over the summer, came back, was the tallest. But when I was little, I wasn't very good. And so I remember being picked last. Of course I was super cool, but that didn't mean I played kickball well. Because I wasn't acceptable to winning. But God says, Donnie, I chose you. God says to you, you are acceptable. And guess what? You want to hear something absolutely crazy? Man, I'm going to end up preaching all five of these things today. I won't, I promise. But you just need to hear this. Chosen and accepted by God while you were still a sinner. See, Jesus died on a cross. He's, the whole time that you're alive, God is working so hard through the power of the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, to draw you to him so that you can realize that you are lost without Jesus. Don't you understand? It's not after you get all cleaned up and you do it all right and you're perfect. Because if that's the standard, I'm done. Right? If that's the standard, while we were still sinners, God chose to love us by sending his son. I'm acceptable before I get it right, not after. Same thing with you. You are accepted by God before. You get it right. In fact, the way he works, if you come to him, he'll help you get it right. Mm, Okay, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. You are royal priests. Royal priests. You are priests. Now, that might be a little bit strange to, to hear you know, because in priests, you may think of Old Testament, the, the priest, or, or maybe you think of like a Catholic church where you have a priest, right? And so you think, well, Donnie, where does that fit in our church? How, why would you call me a priest? Well, a priest was, man, was a way for man to be represented to God and God to be represented to man. It was the go-between. That's us. That's you. See, once you know Jesus as your savior, you become a priest. You become a way. Are you ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. This, you become a a person who can show other people how to meet Jesus. You represent God to man and man to God. You're like, well, wait, 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 wait wait a minute, Donnie. Wait wait a minute. I, I know me. Come on, man. I don't even know a lot of scripture. I don't have a lot of memorized. I, don't, I, I know me. It doesn't matter. Because the spirit of God lives in you. And so when you don't know what to say, guess who gives you the words? The spirit of God. You are qualified to share the good news with other people. <sighs> Can you not in all of this sense the love of the father? In all of this, that while we were still screwed up, while we were still messed up, he loved us and sent Jesus. And he trusts us enough to bring the gospel, the good news to other people. A holy nation. This is very cool. A holy nation, God's very own possession as a result. 
you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Now, things that are holy are pure. Pure. The more pure gold is, the more valuable it is. Right? If you have 10 karat gold, 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold, it's more precious. It's more valuable. But do you know what else makes something value? valuable? God says we are a holy nation. But do you know what else makes something very valuable? Okay, let me, let me illustrate. Let me think of a good example. Okay. At home, I have a Ravens jersey. I do. I wish I would have wore it this morning, guys. Forgive me. I, want, I didn't get the memo. But I have, a, I have a jersey. I have a Ravens jersey hanging in my closet. Love it. So I, I love it. It's, it's Lamar Jackson. Right? It's his jersey. Now, if, if you're a big Ravens fan, you know, it's worn. You might give me, well, I don't know, 50 bucks for it maybe. Maybe yard sale, 25 bucks. Right? Maybe. Humor me. What if it was signed by Lamar? I mean like legit. Sharpie and all, baby. Now what do you think it's worth? Is it worth $30? It's worth $50? $100? We can agree the value's more, right? It's going to be worth a lot more if it has his signature on it, right? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. What if it's actually his? What if it's his? What if you, you can still smell Lamar. I mean, what if it's his jersey? (laughs) Now what's it worth? 80 bucks? 180, you see what I'm saying? It's who owns the possession that adds value. It's not that it's just value. I mean, a, a, a Lamar Jackson jersey all by itself, it, it has value. I mean, I think it's like $100, $150, bucks, something like that. I mean, just on itself. But if it was owned by him, value is I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say priceless, but there are things in our world that because of who they are owned by, that they are priceless. They can't be replaced. You ready? A holy nation. Is it there? God's very own possession. That's what makes you priceless. Because you're his. You belong to him. So you're valuable. You're holy. You're you're valuable to him. But what makes you priceless is that you belong to him. Mm. Man, I just got to reel it back, reel it back, reel it back. I got to tell you this. (laughs) That you're his because he wants you. Because he values you. Because you're worth something to him. Listen to me. Don't you listen to the people in your life that speak against you. That tell you that you're not worthy. That you're not good enough. That you're this or you're that. Don't you listen to them. Because Father God who put you together. Who created you. That knows every part about your body. Says that you are so valuable to him. That he stands up in front of the entire world and says. You are mine. And that makes you priceless. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 10. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Think about that for a minute. You had no identity. I don't even know who I am right now. See the lie there? Because now it says that because of Christ, you are now God's people. We're his people, man. We're his peeps. That's my people. When I, when Jewel and I um, were were brought Westminster Hope Chapel as a place to come and pastor, I said, that's my people. That's where I grew up, man. That's, That's my hood. Well, you know what I mean. 
It never quite sounds as cool coming out of my mouth. That's my people. God says, you're my people. I love you. And I'll tell the whole world. I'll tell anybody that reads 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. I will tell anyone that I love you unconditionally and you are mine. Because you're my people. You're my family. See, when you accept Christ, you come into the family of God. You are now heirs to the kingdom of God. You the man. You the woman. You, you are at a whole different level because you are loved so dearly by the Father. And we're going to talk a lot more about this in a few weeks. But the love that he has for you, I just want you to chew on this. It's unconditional. And I know you've heard that before, but if you lay that in your life, you have a very, very short list of the people that love you without expecting something back from you. That's what it means to be unconditionally loved. Unconditionally loved. Philip Yancey says, you can't do anything to have him love you less. You can't do anything to have him love you more. You are loved because he loves you. Period. There is no but, if. I don't like contractions anyway. There's none of that. There is I love you because I love you because you are mine. And you're my people. And in this, this one, this is the last one. And this may be my favorite. Only because I know me more than you know me. And you know you more than I know you. More than the person sitting next to you, even if you happen to be married to them. You know you. God knows you. And here's what he says. Last part of verse 10. Once you received no mercy. When you and I were lost and we were trying to figure this world out on our own and we weren't anywhere near giving our lives to Jesus. If we died, we would go to hell. There is no mercy outside of Christ. But now you have received God's mercy. See, when you give your life to Christ, you receive God's mercy. You are forgiven. I didn't come up with this statement. I think it was Pastor Chris Hodges from a Highland Church that said this the, the first time I ever heard it. And I've, I've alluded to it a little bit here, but I'm just going to say it very clearly. Hell does not exist and God does not send people to hell because he hates them. Or he doesn't value them. Or he hasn't chosen them or he hasn't accepted them. People simply go to hell because they choose to pay for their sins on their own. Instead of accepting Christ's gift. Mercy. You are forgiven. You are chosen. You are priceless. You are loved. You are forgiven. And you are qualified. You are who God says you are. I I know, trust me, I know how hard it is to hear something like that and take it into your soul. Because you have so many other voices, so much white noise, so much noise going on around in your brain that tells you otherwise. Day after day after day after day. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your savior, if you've, never, if you've never given your life to him, if you've never said, Jesus, you know what? I'm gonna lay my sin down and I'm gonna take your gift of salvation. If you've never done that, then it's even harder to believe that anyone would love you. 
I mean, we don't, we don't say those things. We don't project those things, but they creep into our minds when we're alone. You know, that's how the, do you know that's how a lion kills? It says Satan is a lion seeking who he may devour. You know how lions kill? They don't attack the pack. They attack the animal that's fallen behind. That's alone. So that's when Satan comes after you. And he says, I know you. And he speaks those vile things into your head. I want to give you an opportunity to know the Savior this morning. You don't have to live under that anymore. I want to give you a chance to to give your life to Jesus. You know what? Just just everybody close your eyes. Just everybody close your eyes. I I, I just need a moment, please. Nobody looking around. This is just private. My eyes are closed as well. But I want you to close your eyes just so you can focus for a minute. I want you to pay attention. Nothing else going around you. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, in your heart, I just want you to pray this prayer. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I accept your gift for my sins. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give my life to you. I confess my sins. And I believe that you are risen and alive. In Jesus' name, amen.